I didn't realize that you, sir, once guarded Michael Jordan and did a pretty damn good job, if I hear correctly. Well, we kicked his ass is what we did, Charlie. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. We beat him. Jordan had not – I always tell people he had 13 in the game, but only nine against this guy because I fouled out and he fouled out. Charlie, the bigger story is this. I beat him out of $6,000 playing golf that summer. It was 1984. It was the day he, he signed his Nike deal. Myself, him, two other guys went and played golf. Uh, there, I'm forcing him to the baseline in true Bob Knight st- uh, fashion. Um, but I pay, he, he owed me six grand from a golf game. He tried to pay me in plain pocket jeans and Polaroid cameras that he got for free no. from uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee. But, uh, yeah, basically, I've made Michael Jordan my bitch my whole life, Charlie. That's just what I do. Okay, Look at that so- hair, though. Tell me, Charlie, yeah. you can see why the sorority Let, girls were always flocking around hair. Double D. Look, you got to show. Let's see the I'm hair. I'm telling you, I, you know what? I had to get a damn, I had to go in hiding. I had so many women just hanging around the, look at that hair. Come on. Jordan and I both had hair there. It's pretty good. Okay, so I have, I have many questions. A, when did, when did the hair decide it no longer wanted to be on your head? When did that happen? <sighs> <laughs> it started, that was 84. It came quick, Charlie. By about 88, I was like, huh, how am I going to hide this? Uh, it came quick. And you know what? It, it, that's traumatic for a guy. Like, I tried everything. I saw late night commercials. I was, I was ordering stuff from Belgium, coming into my house, rubbing it on my head. I, that's very hurtful to a young man to all of a sudden go, huh, I got to start parting it this way. With the big swoosh going <laughs> yeah. to hide some stuff going on here. But it all, Charlie, COVID, my back porch, three bottles of wine, my stepson had a, had a razor, and it all went away. We just went, you know what? We came home. We came home with that, Charlie. I, I totally understand. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, you look great, though. I always tell you that. You've got the shiniest head in the game, and it's something you should be proud of. But... <laughs> Also, I want to get back to the game in which you were guarding Michael Jordan. I also heard that it was a flu game for you. You know, we always talk about Michael Jordan's flu game, but you actually entered into that game feeling under the weather. You didn't want to tell anybody about it, I hear. And then you went on to have a tremendous performance. So talk me through what happened. I mean, was that nerve wracking also to know that you were responsible for guarding Michael Jordan? Charlie, honest to God, man, at our pregame meal, about three, three and a half hours before the game, I didn't know if I was starting. I knew I was sick as hell. Didn't tell anybody. And, uh, you know, Knight said, you're guarding Michael Jordan. And I'm like, all right, okay, I'll kick his ass. You know what I mean? That's who. I, that's what I do. And uh, I go up to my hotel room, and I started thinking about it, Charlie. I'm like, man. I'm going to guard Michael Jordan on national TV. I got all my boys back in Gary, Indiana, going to be watching on Channel 2 in Chicago. But you know what? And I opened up, and I got sick. Like, literally, I opened up the hotel room door, and luckily for me, there was, like, right in front of me were a mirrored closet, and then around was the hotel room. And, I mean, I just puked all over the floor. I was, like, everything I'd just eaten at the pregame meal – and I was supposed to be the tough guy on the team and the captain. I couldn't let my roommate see that I'm puking before a big game, right? So I cleaned it up. And I mean, it was just – and I puked on the bench. I didn't let Coach Knight see. I puked on the bench uh, in the first half. And then when I fouled out, I put a towel over my head. And I asked this big security guard for a bucket. And uh, I'm just puking into this bucket and uh, with the towel. And I'm peeking at the game, looking over, you know, cheering – but, uh, you know, I can beat Michael Jordan's ass whether I'm healthy, unhealthy. You know how we do, Charlie. That's just, how, that's just what people like you and I do. We just rise to occasions, Charlie. That's what we do. Okay, so since that game, uh, shutting down Michael Jordan, and, and, and then I want to also touch on the, the golf uh, winnings that he tried to repay you in Polaroids, <laughs> and I don't even remember what the other thing was. Uh, have you had any type of relationship since with Michael Jordan? Like, is there any type of communication that has taken place at any point throughout the year since? 
Yeah, uh, in 1993, his agent was trying to uh, sign a couple of our players, Calbert Chaney, uh, who was the National Player of the Year. So my brother was the liaison at Indiana Basketball between agents and players for Coach Knight, and they invited oh, us, my brother and I, yeah, they invited us to a, um, a playoff game in Chicago Stadium, Bulls against uh, New York Knicks. So we went. And the game's over, and I'm going into the Knicks locker room to see one of our former players, uh, Eric Anderson, and, and the agent comes up to my brother and I and says, hey, man, Michael invited you guys to his restaurant if you want to grab a bite to eat. And what are we going to say? Like, yeah, of course. Hell yeah. We're in. Sign so, me up. Uh, it, yeah. Anyway, game's over. We go visit whatever, and we go to the restaurant, and we go in this upstairs, back, boom, boom, boom. And there's Michael at the head of the table, a bunch of people at a table. We walk in. There's kids. There's, it's a big room. And my brother's a lawyer. He don't care. He just goes back, sits down, makes himself at home. I'm, I'm, I, people don't believe this, but I'm very shy in public settings. And I'm kind of sheepish. And Jordan made me feel that right at home. And <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I don't buy it. You sheepish in public settings? You're shy? Dan Dockich is shy? Very. Oh, very, wow, very. When I go to a party, I never thought I would hear this morning. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Very like afraid. Of, my whole life, afraid of girls. Stand in the corner at parties. Never date. I mean, just you know, just a typical dork. And long story short, the dinner was great. We were there for a while. I'm walking out, and Jordan yells at me and asks me if that covers the six grand he owes me. He goes, "Hey, Doc, does that cover the money I owe you from golf?" And I'm like, no, because I used to write him a letter every year, Charlie. Um, I got his home address from a friend of mine who built his house, and I did a basketball camp in Gary, Indiana. So I used to write him a letter, same letter every year, yo, MJ, uh, you owe me six grand golf, whatever, uh, come to my basketball camp for five minutes, we'll play golf after, the debt is off, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, never showed, never heard back from him, but he said, will you stop writing me those letters? And I go, no. You owe me six grand, and I walked out. So I told you, Michael Jordan's my bitch. Oh, my God. That's fantastic. I love that story. Um, okay, well, at least you got maybe a little part of the debt repaid, but you're still waiting for that check to clear. Uh, I'm not sure at yeah. this rate you're going to get it. Uh, but that's interesting. So no. a few things. One, you said your brother worked as the liaison between the uh, agents and the players in, at the school. Is that... I didn't realize your brother was also involved in the basketball world. No, my brother is a uh, lawyer. My brother is a guy who oh. we grew up in Gary, Indiana. And right now my brother is basically, uh, well, I mean, he, he's very, very, very smart. He's, 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 he's the smart, good looking one in the family. And he, uh, he builds data centers. He builds hotels, redoes downtowns, raises millions and millions of dollars. He's 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 saving Northwest Indiana, uh, and he's brilliant and smart. And uh, as he says, he he's the handsome one. Okay, uh, interesting. Well, something else I wanted to ask you about because I feel like you might have an opinion. Uh, this gets back to Michael Jordan. Did you, were you aware? I mean, it's, I think they've been dating for over a year now, but Michael Jordan's son, Marcus Jordan, is dating <laughs> Scottie Pippen's ex wife, Larsa. Do you, did you, were you aware of that? Okay, I, I, from what I understand, they recently broke up. A lot of people think it's just for headlines because I think she is, or they're releasing a podcast. There's something, for some reason, that people have some type of a mindset that this could be for publicity purposes, but regardless. What is your what is your what are your thoughts on the fact that Michael Jordan's son, who is I want to say at least ten years younger than Scottie Pippen's ex wife and 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 Larsa, are or were dating? It is bizarre to me. Uh, I recruited Marcus. I recruited Marcus and his other brother to try to come to Bowling Green. So I, I don't know him. But when I heard that, I thought, all right, that's like an onion. You know, the onion or, or the Babylon Bee, that kind of thing. Like Michael Jordan's son yes. is uh, – that's one of the oddest things that I've seen. It, it, it truly is. And I'm happy for both. Love is love. Great for them. Yay, Ra, go fight, win. But it is truly one of the oddest things that I've ever seen. It's almost like this, Charlie. If you were watching a movie and somebody put that on the screen – 
and said, that's what is going to happen, you would look and I would look and we'd go, okay, now that's not happening. Now that's just too stupid, you know, for even a movie. Like reasonable people would look around and go, yeah, that's that, nah. But it is. And what do they always say? Uh, real life is more interesting than the movies or whatever. I don't know the right saying. But if you were going to say to me, Michael Jordan's son, Marcus, is going to be dating Larsa Pippen, Scotty's wife, 10 years after, however many after they all retired. I would have put anything you want on that because I remember Marcus as a skinny kid trying to be a basketball player. And, I, and at the same time, Larsa Pippen was running around with Scotty Pippen and they were the you know power couple of the world or whatever. So I got to tell you, that's one of the weirdest things, but good for him. And, you know, I mean, we've all seen – what was it, Stifler's mother? So maybe that's like a goal of most young guys. I don't know. <laughs> I don't maybe, know. maybe. Although I've also heard the other side of the argument that men want the younger women, right? That there's always the stories you hear of of men eventually leaving their wives for the younger woman. So I don't know. Maybe it goes in both directions. But if you look at it as a man, who's winning in the situation? Is it Michael Jordan? Because his son oh. managed to pull Scottie Pippen's ex-wife. You know, there, we know there's a little bit of animosity maybe still lingering between the two. Or does Scottie Pippen feel like he has the upper hand because he's like, oh, MJ's son has my leftovers. Like, which side do you think <laughs> has more of like the, I guess, higher ego in this situation? Well, I would imagine both of them have pretty good egos, and I would imagine Michael Jordan because Michael's going to say what you just said. Damn, man. Your wife went from you to my son? Like, what are you doing? But there is the famous story, of course, that Madonna was having the sex with Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan, oh. you can look this story up. Michael Jordan <laughs> was hitting on Madonna hard. I mean, Michael Jordan was trying hard to get with Madonna, and Madonna said, no, 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 no. Scotty is too good. You get away. And Michael Jordan got shut down by Madonna. That is a famous story that is public. I'm not making stuff up. That is a public yeah. story. So Scotty Pippen has the shun because of his greatness with Madonna, that Madonna told the great Michael Jordan, no, 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 I stay with Scotty. Yeah. You wow. come to me, baby. You get TMZ light right here. You get, I got this, all this the dirt. What great. else you need to know? <laughs> I, there's a lot that I need to know. I also need to know how you feel about Madonna these days because the stuff, I had to unfollow her because it was so disturbing. Have you seen the photos that she's put up in the past year. I mean, she's had so much work done uh, to her face, to her body. Uh, and the way that she represents herself is very, very disturbing, Dan, I must say. You know, there there is something about aging gracefully and moving in to, like, elderly status, iconic status. I think people think of Meryl Streep when they think of somebody that has moved into, you know, maybe even Richard Gere that has moved into kind of an iconic, and that's a good place to be. That is. and But it ain't Madonna. You know, I, I saw her falling. I saw her holding on to a bar. I mean, she could be the icon of music. She could be the grand dame or whatever you want to still could be beautiful, still could be vibrant, still. But all of a sudden you do all this stuff to just try to stay young. And you know, father time's a mother, Charlie. I mean, father time don't mess around. Mother nature ain't screwing around. So, you know, it, it's like, it, it's like I used to, I used to think that my former coach, Bob Knight should move into, you know, just iconic status. And he never won. Madonna, baby, you know, we got eyes we can see. Just move into iconic status. Be the advisor. You know, Dolly Parton, right? Dolly Parton has never been more popular, probably. Yeah. She just keeps and it she classy. Looks fantastic. Keeps it Right. Right. And, and that's what Madonna should have been because whatever people think about Madonna, I mean, uh, in the eighties, nineties, Madonna was big, really big. And she could have oh, moved yeah. right into that and instead she's 
She's got a bad plastic surgeon is what the hell she's got. Uh, yeah, she's a plastic surgeon who doesn't know how to tell her no, uh, which is a real problem, uh, I could imagine. Uh, I just want to throw it out there for everybody that you talk about the popularity of Madonna. I, when I was in, I think I was in kindergarten, or no, I think I was in pre-kindergarten, I did a jazz routine to Madonna's Material Girl. So Very nice. You know. Very nice. Yeah. You have video? Yes, yes. Uh, probably. I think there is video that exists. At least there's photos. So maybe I'll, I'll dig those up when I'm home in Indianapolis. Because my mother, literally, I mean, I don't know if moms still operate on the same wav- wavelength, but my mom took pictures of every single moment of every single occasion. She had the camcorder out and she always joked. She's like, people probably think I didn't exist because I was never in the videos because I was always taking them of you and your dad and everybody else. So... You know, as far as uh, the videos portray, my mother did not exist. But yeah, I'm sure that there's some video evidence of the material girl, material girl performance. So I will uh, dig that out of the archives. Now, one last thing, Dan, before I let you go, I want to hit one last sports topic. Uh, Kirk Herbstreet recently made some comments that the college football world needed a commissioner because it would do some good for, you know, all of the issues that we're having with the NIL portal. So let's take a listen to what he had to say and we'll react. You take the Big Ten, whoever it's going to be, it's like 60 teams. If it's the Big Ten and it's the SEC and the ACC and the Big 12 and whoever else, I think think they should go form their own world, create their own governing body, get one voice, one commissioner, instead of everybody having to get an agreement where these guys don't always feel comfortable with each other, Get one voice. You imagine the NFL if they had nine commissioners for each division or whatever it would be. I mean, it, there's a commissioner of the AFC South. There's a commissioner of the NFC North. And they'd all have to agree on stuff. No, no, all these guys care about is their own map. Greg Sankey's concerned about the SEC. You know, Tony's worried about the Big Ten. Jim's worried about the ACC. And around and around we go. And so we need one voice. So I would pull out away from the NCAA, create my own governing body. I would partner with the players. I think you have to go through things like NIL and make some realistic changes in NIL. This is ridiculous. You got to talk about the transfer portal. You got to make that more accommodating to the players and the coaches where you have more, more staying uh, power for a program. This, this is ridiculous right now. Players, they just leave whenever they want to leave. You you can't do that. So we need rules around that. And then you're going to eventually probably have revenue sharing. I mean, you're going to probably have to all this money that's being thrown into this world you're going to have to share that. So you you partner with a player's union or an entity of some kind, and then you enforce rules. So obviously, Dan, that was from your show. Big, big pull for a guest there. So props to you. Um, you had a lot to say about it on your show. I know you feel strongly about this issue. A lot of people do. Even Nick Saban recently came out and started talking about the dangers of NIL and what it was doing to the landscape of college football. But reiterate your thoughts. Uh, what do you think a commissioner could do and how it could help college football in terms of NIL? Well, you know what? I'm not sure how it can help in terms of NIL, but I think it would help with structure. And I think Herbie's absolutely right. Here's what's happening in college football. It feels like, and a lot of people think, there's going to end up being two conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC, and however they want to call it. And you know what? Uh, If you've got the Big Ten and you've got a Big Ten commissioner, obviously they're going to be concerned about the Big Ten. The SEC, same thing. But who is concerned about the overall league? You know, if the NFL, when the NFL gets going, they they have 32 teams. They're not all separate entities But they, well, they are separate entities, but under one roof. You can say, well, it's under the NCAA, but people that know know that the NCAA doesn't control the college football playoff. I think Herb Street is absolutely right. I think you need somebody that has a sports background, but is also a lawyer. You know, I don't know who that is exactly to come in, oversee it. And it's, remember this when you, when you do something like get a commissioner, you don't just have one guy. You've got layers to it. Here's the commissioner. Here are the different uh, liaisons, representatives. And I think that's where we're headed. I really do. Because you're going to see two things possibly come up, Charlie. You're going to see the NCAA college basketball tournament have a different structure with more teams involved. You're going to see college football 
eventually these guys are going to break away if they haven't already, and a commissioner in both would be huge. I would love to see a commissioner in college basketball. But what I would love to see more than any of that is I would love to see whether it's through Congress or through just negotiation – I would like to see some guardrails for the things that Herbie is talking about. Guardrails for NIL, not pay for play like we have. Now, NIL means name, mm-hmm. image, likeness. Not, hey, Charlie, I'm going to give you $200,000 to come play for my school. That should not have. And the transfer portal is ridiculous, and it's not good for kids. I'd like to see some guardrails. And if it takes a commissioner to get that, then get a commissioner in there and do it as quick as you can. Because the NCAA... Look, here's what happens with the NCAA. They used to be the governing body, but they always lose in court. They never win. They're like 0-15. Mm-hmm. So every time something happens, somebody takes them to court. Every time they make a ruling, somebody takes them to court, and it gets thrown out. You need a commissioner. You need structure. You need organization that everybody can get behind. And right now, frankly, it ain't there in either sport. And it's going to have to be as the NCAA tournament expands and as college football expands and college football becomes more and more a two-league freaking uh, world. Well, I have an idea. I'm going to throw it out there to end the show. I think we see the first ever brother duo acting as commissioners uh, for the NCAA college basketball realm because, Dan, with your expertise in the field, your sports knowledge, your experience, coupled with your brother's legal expertise, talk about the NCAA never wins in court. I don't know. Yeah. This could be a power couple in terms of a commissioner. So I'm going to throw uh, the Dockage brothers' names in the hat for uh, an idea for a commissioner. I don't know if you're okay with that, but I'm, I'm going to go forth with, with my plan. Well, Goodell makes $44 million a year as a commissioner of the NFL. There's more teams in college sports. I'd be happy to split it with my brother. We'll go $22 million apiece. I'll take the job tomorrow. I'll change my clothes, put a suit and tie on. And you know what? I'm in, Charlie. I'm in. And I'm, and I'm going to take a little bit of commission <laughs> because I feel oh, like you get without 10%. me... 10% agents fees. Okay, perfect. Well, Dan, uh, this is a plan. I hope this happens. And then uh, I'm a few million dollars richer uh, when we speak next. This sounds great. And I hope that the red carpet is rolled out for me when I touch down in Indianapolis oh, next yeah. week. So I'll let you know how that goes. But as always, thank you so much for coming on. You have a big couple of hours coming up on Don't At Me with Dan Dockage hitting the Outkick Airwaves 9 to 11, Monday through Friday. So Dan, Thank you, thank you, my friend, and we'll see you soon. I look like a human thumb. I hate the way I look. I'm going to go get a toupee. I'll see you later. (laughs) Oh, a human thumb. Uh, Love it. Uh, Dan's always a... We'll just call him a blessing. He's always a blessing to have on the show. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Hope you had fun. That was an interesting conversation. We went here, we went here, we went here. But that's how it goes when you get me and Dan Dockage on the same, well, I was going to say in the same room, but on the same Zoom channel. Uh, We'll leave it at that. Everyone, make sure you're following me on social media at Charlie on TV, and I will see all of you tomorrow for another episode. Have a good one.